Hi, I'm Agata Kowalewska from the University of Warsaw and this presentation is titled Of Deer, Wolves and Men, Emergent Non-Human Cultures in Spaces of Conflict with Humans. Uh, and this presentation is an introduction to a new project that I'm working on and it references a couple of papers that I've either already published or that, published or that are uh, currently in print. The main argument I will be making is that appreciation of the importance of key individuals within animal uh, communities as repositories of socially transmitted knowledge and their protection are crucial not only for conservation efforts and resilience of biodiversity, but also in managing spaces of conflict between humans and non-humans, whether immediately threatened with extinction or not. After evolutionary biologist Kevin, Kevin Lalland, I understand animal culture or tradition as all group typical behavior patterns shared by members of animal communities that are to some degree reliant on socially learned and transmitted information. It also accounts for some of the behavioral variation among populations. There is no agreement among researchers in the field as to whether a variance in behavior has to be first proven not to be a result of genetic or uh, ecological factors to be deemed cultural. Um, but as nature versus nurture opposition has long been deemed unproductive by behavioral developmentalists, Laland and Yannick argue that categorical separation between cultural, ecological and genetic reasons for variance in behavior too is now outdated and more interesting insight can be gained by looking at the interplay of the three and the contribution of the cultural factors. Some of the clearest examples of animal cultures uh, are observed in primates, cetaceans and birds. Birds are very interesting here uh, as their songs are very often um, taught uh, culturally uh, and they can have uh, like viral spreads um, of uh, of new songs. In West Africa, chimpanzees have been using tools to crack nuts for at least 4,300 years, uh, as evidenced by archaeological sites, but only east of the Sassandra River in Ivory Coast, even though the necessary um, environmental requirements, so all the tools for the, um, so for the, all the materials for the tools and the nuts themselves, are present also west of the river. In an experiment, uh, East African chimpanzees living on an island reserve that had not developed nutcracking technologies were exposed to an expert nutcracker, and after a while all of them started cracking nuts using tools. It should be noted here that uh, this skill increases the chimpanzees' fitness by improving their access to food sources and is therefore not arbitrary. However, arbitrary material cultures in non-human animals have also been observed. Some researchers, uh, for example, some sociocultural anthropologists, argue such simple utilitarian food-related behaviour is at most analogous, not homologous, to cultures of humans and should not be called that. Others, however, and it seems they're decidedly more numerous, uh, including many evolutionary biologists, uh, claim a number of species do indeed have cultures and it, and it is productive to treat them as such even though it remains to be documented in most forms of life, including plants, fungi, and do we know they don't have cultures? No, we don't. Uh, so it's interesting to, um, to ask uh, these questions. And um, they would certainly be very interesting cultures. And most of the major fill of animals, in both unicellular and multicellular. Based on his studies of Japanese macaques, uh, Jean-Baptiste Lecca uses non-conceptive sex of female macaques, both with males and with other females, as an example of cultural behaviour. Social learning, which is a concept very closely linked um, to non-human cultures. So social learning is also conceptualised um, as the second inheritance system, with the first being genetic inheritance. There is also ecological inheritance, where individuals inherit the material products uh, of the work of previous generations, like in the case of beaver dams uh, or termite mounds. These do not have to be um, um, blood-related to uh, inherit, obviously. 
Importantly, unlike a genetic inheritance, social learning happens not only vertically from uh, one generation to the next, but also horizontally through observation of peers, like in the case of the nutcrackers. Traditionally, um, conservation efforts concentrate on younger individuals with immediately obvious reproductive potential. However, older individuals can have uh, a positive impact on the skill level, knowledge and expertise of younger generations, as well as their reproductive success, as is the case in African elephants, where the old matriarchs have been shown to increase the fertility of younger females in their social group. In killer whales, highly stable matrilineal so social structure and long postmenopausal lifespan of females facilitates uh, the role of matriarchs in passing on the ecological and social knowledge. For any species, successful reintroduction programs require individuals to be uh, behaviourally competent. The importance of non-human culture for conservation efforts seems to have recently been more or less widely accepted. My particular interest here is in spaces of... Oh, sorry, my dog. <laughs> um, um, sorry, my particular interest here is <laughs> in spaces of human-animal conflict and animal adaptations to navigating anthropogenic landscapes, living near cities, farms and crossing busy roads. <laughs> As these environments are relatively new, so are the adaptations, and they seem to rely more strongly uh, on social learning. Starting with, the, uh, so starting with the landscapes that I know, I'm now looking at some of the species that humans in Poland tend to come into conflict with, uh, which are of various different protection statuses, including wild boars, roe deer, beavers and wolves. Emergence of subpopulations with distinctive cultural profiles happens either through um, spontaneous innovation or introduction of new habits from the outside, so it's taught from the outside. As novel ecosystems emerge from changing environments and non-human animals uh, adapt to living in these changed worlds, their cultural practices, social relations and material cultures, cultures change too. From the social learning perspective, this is especially visible in the case of animals that are hunted a lot, uh, as uh, hunters tend to go for the most impressive, mature individuals, often uh, pack or herd leaders. European roe deer populations, it's a small deer species, have been growing in the last um, several decades, making them one of the most ubiquitous large animals um, in Europe, although now in Poland their numbers started falling again. Previously, roe deer lived almost exclusively in forests, either living either solitary lives or in herds of up to like four or six animals. But in the early 20th century, mainly in Central and Eastern Europe, people started observing um, roe deers move to the fields and an accompanying change in their social, social structures. They behaved more like antelopes. Easy access to food and open fields meant no competition. Easy access to food in open fields, sorry, meant no competition. So for most part of the year, large groups started forming for added safety. Um, also, as now, the animals could see uh, the predators from afar and the more pairs of eyes, the better. So they started living in the fields year round. Uh, through this microevolutionary adaptation, a new population of field road deer emerged with a new social structure, feeding strategy and habits. But in the meantime, with the proliferation of cars and road transport over the last century, roads have cut through the landscape and crossing these roads became an inescapable part of many animals' lives, including the roe deer. Now, a single roe deer, or any kind of deer, for that matter, uh, crossing a road is already dangerous for everyone involved. But when a herd of several dozen rush rushes across, uh, it can be catastrophic. So herds of these animals are usually led uh, by an older, experienced doe who knows how to navigate human-transformed environments, including how to safely cross, cross the road. Um, however, current hunting practices often disregard these social structures and leaders get shot before they can pass on their knowledge. Without it, younger deer panic when crossing roads, getting in more accidents with humans in cars. A similar thing happens with wild boars, one of the poster animals, uh, of course, for the recent conflicts with humans. Fearless invaders of cities, cunning raiders of trash cans who terrorise entire neighbourhoods, beaches and playgrounds. 
largely due to intensive hunting, most boars do not live to be more than a couple years old, even though their lifespan in the wild can reach over 10 years. Because of the hunting pressure, many adapt their usually closely related matriarch matriarchal social units to include uh, unrelated individuals, survivors, or survivors on the, of the hunts, changing their social structure and disrupting the transfer of knowledge. The current situation seems to suggest um, the, that the strategy of indiscriminate mass elimination is only ma making matters worse and significantly so. Uh, at this point, I would also uh, like to, uh, to point to the ferality of these cultural processes, understood as the being rooted in entanglements uh, with human infrastructures and systems of domination, but developing outside of human control. Perhaps it can be one of the keys to understanding some of these emergent cultures happening on the borders, constantly interrupted, born from rejection, exclusion and conflict. Um, back to examples, when there is a sufficiently large and stable population of wolves and, uh, and older individuals can pass on their accumulated experience, the pack can hunt large animals, deer, elk, wild boar, moose and bison. Depending on where they are, uh, depending on where they live, of course, uh, whether these animals are available there. But this kind of prey is difficult, uh, requires team effort and expertise. And even with the right numbers and experience, only some attacks end in success for the wolves. So when the pack is thinned and its leaders killed, younger, inexperienced wolves in low numbers have to turn to easier prey, uh, which often means poorly protected farm animals like sheep, chickens and calves. Farmed animals are slower and their senses are weaker. Uh, and in pens and enclosures, there's obviously nowhere to run or hide. So they are very easy prey if the wolves manage to gain access to them. Whenever these attacks happen, voices are then raised that the wolves are dangerous and their populations should be curbed. And the cycle repeats again. Um, and in the last part, uh, I would like to speculate a little um, about the possible consequences of these findings. Will we once again uh, see attempts at Cold War style animal espionage? Mind you, a couple of years ago, uh, a lonely beluga whale was found off the coast of Norway wearing a harness and a camera with a name of a Russian city firing up, pe fire up, firing up people's imaginations. Uh, but nothing was obviously ever established. Uh, can we better learn from experienced does? Uh, how to better design animal highway crossings. Uh, sorry, that's my dog again. Um, highway crossings, and then foster these matriarchs' ability to share their knowledge. <laughs> Can we send specially educated elephants to teach resident populations how to avoid poachers? Or where artificial water sources are being built? On the other hand, looking at human history, would these novel missionaries end up bringing violent ends to the extant worlds. Thank you very much. And have a have a very good day. Thank you. Bye.